Welcome to Crossroads Nazarene Church's online worship. Thank you for joining us in our teaching series, Spiritual Bedrock, the core truths upon which our life's foundation is built. For more information about Crossroads, please visit our website at cvcrossroads.com. There you can find out more about our church, online giving, and small groups. You can also find us on Facebook at CV Crossroads. Well, good morning. It is wonderful to be with you today and for us to be able to worship the Lord together. And we're online. However, the wonderful thing about God's people is we can be one in spirit and encouraging one another and praying for one another no matter where we are. And so that's what we're doing this morning. Good to have you here with us. We are in a new message series that is titled, What Can This Become? In this series, we are examining God's Word to identify the spiritual bedrock upon which we are building the foundation of our lives. Let me give you a definition of spiritual bedrock. Spiritual bedrock is the core truths upon which my life's foundation is built. Last week, we began the series and discovered that there are only two kinds of spiritual bedrock. The first is called flesh bedrock. If the foundation of our life is built upon flesh bedrock, our primary objective in life is to pursue and attempt to find meaning in life by chasing after things that are temporary, things that just do not last. Flesh bedrock is based upon fulfilling our desires, our lusts, and our wants. It's probably best described by the mantra that says, if it feels good, do it. By contrast is spirit bedrock. Spirit bedrock is the foundation of our lives if we are in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus gives us eternal life. And those who are in Christ have been set free from condemnation because Jesus took our sins upon himself when he died on the cross. So the outcome of flesh bedrock, we are told, is death. But the word also says the outcome of spirit bedrock is eternal life. Last Sunday in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, we discovered that when we build the foundation of our lives upon spirit bedrock, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you did not have the opportunity to hear the message last week, please go to our website to download message notes and to view a video of the message. It is very helpful. Today's Bible lesson comes to us from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17. Let's read the passage and then discover how, in addition to no condemnation, when we build our lives upon spirit bedrock, we are adopted into God's family. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17 in the New International Version says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Before we explore our adoption into being sons and daughters of God, notice with me a vitally important truth about the spiritual bedrock we are building our lives upon, whether that be flesh or spirit bedrock. Verses 12 and 13 say, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Note Paul's words, specifically those words, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. We are obligated and we will live our lives according to the spiritual bedrock 
upon which our lives are being built. Obligation is defined as a debt of gratitude for a service or a favor. This is given joyfully and gratefully because of what God has provided for us in Jesus Christ. However, if flesh bedrock defines my core value in life, values in life, I am under obligation to live based on unstable temporary goals, temporary priorities, pursuits that I am following because I believe they give meaning and purpose to my life. Verse 13 warns that whoever lives according to flesh bedrock will die spiritually. It's all temporary. Paul is writing these words to those in Rome who claim to be building their lives on spirit bedrock. He addresses his audience as brothers and sisters. All who are members of God's family are under no obligation whatsoever to live according to the flesh. In fact, we owe nothing to the flesh. We owe our Christian life and eternal life to God, who reconciled us to Himself through His Son and gave us His Spirit that we might be set free from sin and live in freedom. So our obligation, our debt of gratitude, is to live according to the guidance of the Holy Spirit that God has given to us. We must continually remember that it is the power of the Spirit it's not our own strength that enables us to put to death the misdeeds of the body and to truly live as God created us to live. We are promised that if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Those living out our obligation, our debt of gratitude to God, by building our lives upon spirit bedrock are given eternal life. I am a longtime fan of the 60s television series, The Andy Griffith Show. In one of the episodes, Gomer Pyle is at the gas station and he's taking a nap. There's a metal trash container close by and for some reason it catches fire. And Andy arrives just as the fire is beginning to grow. He promptly puts it out and Gomer is convinced that Andy has saved him from being burnt to a crisp. Gomer immediately commits every free moment to find ways to thank Andy. He catches a whole bunch of trout and brings them over first thing in the morning for breakfast. He cuts about five cords of firewood and stacks them all over the front porch so they can't hardly get into their house. And in the midst of, of it all and everything he does, Gomer keeps saying this, Well, that's the least I can do for someone who just saved my life. When we grasp how God has reached out to us, how He gave His Son as a perfect sacrifice for our sin, how we are provided a dependable bedrock upon which we can build the foundation of our life on earth and throughout eternity, how there is no condemnation as we are living in Christ. These awarenesses stir up within our hearts a grateful, blessed obligation. We resolve to live according to the spirit bedrock, that guidance provided by the Holy Spirit. It is a joyful obligation that we live out in our relationship with God. So today, let's open another incredible gift that God has provided to us. Let's explore the incredible gift of adoption into the family of God. When a person chooses to build his or her life on spirit bedrock, that person is adopted into God's family. Look at me at verses 15 to 17. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. Paul lived in the first century. He was a contemporary of Jesus Christ, although he never 
met Jesus Christ in person while Jesus was on earth. During Paul's lifetime, the Roman Empire was ruling the world in which he lived. Paul himself had the unique distinction and privilege of being a Roman citizen. So when he uses the analogy of adoption to describe the Christ follower's relationship with God, Paul was speaking from his own knowledge of Roman laws concerning adoption. Some of these laws are similar to our laws today, but to understand Paul's example, we need to understand how the Roman Empire defined adoption. And so we are going to clarify some of those descriptions that Paul uses in this analogy. Specifically, there are four significant outcomes of first century Roman adoption that will help us in understanding our relationship as sons and daughters being adopted into God's family. First, the adopted person lost his, all rights in his or her old family and gained all the rights of a legitimate son and daughter in his or her new family. In other words, he or she got a new father. While the adopted child was genetically from his or her birth parents, upon adoption, the child was no longer known or identified by the birth parents. Instead, every right of a legitimate child was gained. It was an entire new identity. Paul applies the same status to all who are in Christ. Prior to our new life in Christ, our former way of living was spiritual death and separation from God. The rights of our former family were being applied to us. Yet when we stepped over the line into the life of forgiveness and relationship with God, the rights of our former way of living were removed. In place of spiritual death, in our new family, we receive eternal life. In place of condemnation and separation from God due to the ways of our former way of living according to the flesh, we are completely forgiven and begin living in the rights of no condemnation in our new family. In Roman law, the adopted child is given a new identity. His or her past is gone. The rights of the new family are fully applied. In our lives, when we compare the rights of our old family, the flesh bedrock family, with our new family, the spirit bedrock family, our adoption into God's family frees us from the wages of sin, which is death, and it awaits all who are a part of the flesh bedrock family. In its place, we receive the rights and gifts and privileges of our new family, which is the family of God. Second, in first century Roman adoption, the adopted person became heir to his or her new father's estate. Even if other siblings were born afterwards, it did not affect his or her status. Verse 17 says, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. As adopted children of God, we have received a glorious inheritance. We are heirs of God co-heirs with Christ. In Roman adoption, there is no distinction whatsoever between a child born into the family and an adopted child. All of the resources, blessings, and inheritances of God's child are ours. Third, in Roman adoption, the old life of the adopted person was completely wiped out. All deaths were canceled. He or she was regarded as a new person entering into a new life with which the past had nothing to do. Debts were gone. God wants us to know in His family there are no second-class children. When we begin building our lives on the bedrock of the Holy Spirit, our former spiritual history is removed. We become reborn spiritually into God's family. And from that moment forward, we are treated as if we had never been a part of the flesh bedrock family. As we are promised in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Our understanding of our, of our identity as heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ is critically important, and here's why. As long as we will identify and label ourselves by the way that we lived in our former family, we will not be able to fully appreciate what it means to be an heir in God's family. There are many Christ followers who, as they are building their lives upon the bedrock of the Spirit, will find themselves reminded, accused, sometimes defeated with memories of past sin and rebellion against God. Under such circumstances, it is impossible to fully live in the freedom of no condemnation when, in our memories and thoughts, we condemn ourselves through ongoing guilt and regret and shame. If that is a struggle for anyone listening, listen to the Holy Spirit speaking to you personally through Paul. Here's what he says. You have a new identity. The old way of living by the flesh is dead and gone. God erased the memory of your past sins and failures the moment you became a child in His family. So today, you are living in the full rights of an heir of God and a co-heir with Jesus Christ Himself. God wants you to know you have a new identity. Your identity is that of being under no condemnation because you are a full-fledged, card-carrying member of God's family. In God's eyes, your past is erased. You are now His child, and He delights in you. The sin debt that we accumulated when we built our lives upon flesh bedrock is gone. Timex watches for 40 years or so, from 1950 into the 1990s, their slogan was, Timex watches take a lickin' and keep on tickin'. In their commercials, Timex would present all kinds of creative ways to show how durable and dependable their watches were. They would put watches under water, they would drop them off buildings, all sorts of things, and, and the watch would pass the test and the commercial would close with Timex. Takes a lickin' and keeps on ticking. In one particular test, a Timex watch was attached to the propeller blade of a single engine airplane. In great suspense, the engine roared to life and the propeller began to spin faster and faster. After a few moments at full throttle, the engine was turned down and turned off. The propell propeller was deaccelerated and eventually stopped spinning. The announcer rushed up to the propeller in great excitement, ready to say, it's still working because Timex takes a licking and keeps on ticking. Instead, in an excited voice, he said, it's, it's, it's gone. I don't think they ever did find that watch. Here's what God, our Father, wants us to know about our sin. It's, it's, it's gone. Our former life, our BC life, our before Christ life is completely wiped out. Our sin debt is canceled. We are regarded as a new person entering into a new life with which the past has nothing to do. The debt has been canceled. Number four. In Roman adoption, once the adoption was finalized, in the eyes of the law, the child was absolutely, with no exceptions, the child of his or her new father. In Paul's day, when the Roman adoption ceremony was carried out, there were seven witnesses required to be present. Suppose the adopting father died at some point following the adoption and a dispute arose about the right of the adopted child to receive a full inheritance. If such an incident were to take place, one or more, or even all, 
of the seven witnesses stepped forward and swore that the adoption was genuine. The right of the adopted child was guaranteed and the inheritance was fully received. When we are spiritually adopted into God's family, the Holy Spirit is our witness. He is our witness to our adoption into a new father and into a new family. Look at verses 16 and 17. The Spirit Himself testifies or witnesses with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. So the Holy Spirit Himself, whom Jesus describes as the Spirit who leads us into all truth that is in Christ Jesus, is the witness to our adoption in the family of God. Note with me how this shared inheritance is described. We're heirs with God, co-heirs with Christ, and then Paul says, if indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. So our inheritance and into the family of God contains two joyful obligations on our part, two joyful obligations. First is the joy of sharing in Christ's sufferings. Now I know that we do not naturally consider suffering to be a cause for joy. And Paul is certainly not telling us to go out of our way to find ways to suffer and to find some way to be happy about it. What he is saying is that when we build our life's foundation upon the spirit bedrock, there will be opposition and antagonism and at times suffering at the hands of some whose bedrock is the flesh. When this occurs, Paul reminds us that this is part of what it means to be a member of God's family. When we are suffering as a result of being God's child, we are reminded that it is part of our inheritance. And we are to bear the, the suffering with a mindset that it identifies with the God who loved us so much that He sent His only Son to suffer in our place and to pay for our sin. Second, Paul talks about the joy of sharing in Christ's glory. In these words, he is assuring us that one day, the trials and struggles of this earth will be concluded, and we will step foot into our new home, into a home that we are told is not made with human hands, but made by our Father God Himself, an eternal home with our name on it, as heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. That kind of joy, the joy of sharing in Christ's glory, will be incredible beyond description. Our joyful obligation to God is to live now, to live today with the awareness of the words that are stated in the hymn, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. So here's our circumstance. Once we were in the absolute control of our own sinful fleshly nature. But God in His mercy has brought us into His absolute possession. The old life has no more rights or control over us. God has an absolute right. The past is canceled and its debts are wiped out. We begin a new life with God and become heirs of all His riches. We also become joint heirs with our Savior, Jesus Christ, God's own Son. That which Christ inherits, we also inherit. It's adoption. We did nothing to deserve entering into the family of God. Yet God, in His amazing love and mercy, has taken the lost and the helpless and the poverty-stricken and the debt-laden sinner and adopted him or her into His own family so that the debts are canceled and the glory inherited. God does not want you to be on the outside of His family looking in. He invites you to be 
His loved child. He offers to remove the flesh bedrock of your life that leads to death and to replace it with spirit bedrock. When the foundation of our lives is being built upon spirit bedrock, we are building upon the certainty of the bedrock of no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus and also upon the bedrock of our adoption into the family of God. Let's pray together. Father, what a wonderful and incredible blessing we receive in understanding that as your children, you have adopted us into your family with all the rights of a son and a daughter. God, today there may be those who are kind of wavering between the different types of bedrock, the spirit bedrock and the flesh bedrock. Father, as we take a step back and as we see the consequences of those two types of foundation uh, that we're building upon, we would ask that you would allow us to very clearly identify where we can receive your grace and your forgiveness and no condemnation and become your children. If there is anyone today who would say, God, I've been on the wrong bedrock. My foundation is built in the wrong place. And who would say, God, I want to build my life upon the spirit bedrock, upon no condemnation, upon being adopted into your family. Father, thank you so much that all that is involved in us changing that bedrock and becoming a part of your family is to say, Jesus, I take advantage I accept your offer of forgiveness for sin that you paid on the, on the cross. God, make me your child. Lead me and direct my life with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, that we can be adopted into your family. In Christ's name, amen. Today, we celebrate as Christ, as children of God, the incredible privileges of having our lives built, the foundation of our life built upon spirit bedrock that leads to eternal life, that leads to a life of meaning and joy here, and a life of eternity in Christ's presence himself. Have a great week and God bless you.